Well, this is exactly how I wanted to spend my 28th birthday. At home, alone. Thank you, Governor Baker. What's this? A present from an old friend. This better not have been the same asshole who sent me a very minty Christmas. The Lion King? Now that brings me back. Like, way back. The Lion King was actually the first movie that I ever watched in theaters. Although I was two at the time, so I don't remember much about the actual theater-going experience. However, I have watched the film more times than I can count. It was my favorite way back when, and I was obsessed with it as a kid. Nowadays, I have more of a heart for Hunchback and Notre Dame. But as a kid... This was my movie. The songs were absolutely fantastic, and it had this size and scale that Disney didn't really recapture until Frozen. And no, I'm not just talking about financial success. These movies, Lion King especially, were massive. Some of these shots just look big. As a result, it does kind of suffer from what I call the big screen effect. To truly appreciate either of those movies, you do need to see it on the big screen in theaters. That might be one of the reasons that public opinion of Frozen has waned over the years, and why Lion King isn't quite my favorite anymore. Although, like I said, either way, The Lion King is a great movie. Even as an adult, I can say that this one really does hold up. I appreciate the plot reference to Hamlet, but I do think that the characters themselves just hold strong. Mufasa, voiced by James Earl Jones, still resonates today. He has just the most sage-like voice. It's so iconic and fitting. A king's time as ruler rises and falls like the sun. One day, Simba... The sun will set on my time here, and will rise with you as the new king. And this will all be mine? Everything. Which makes Mufasa's death all the more tragic, and it's a Disney moment that doesn't hold back. With Bambi, we only hear the gunshot. It basically happens off screen. With Pinocchio, we only see the transformation happening in silhouettes. Lion King doesn't show the moment of impact, of course, but it, uh shows the death letting Simba slowly realize what had happened. It's a movie that was just designed to be a masterpiece. Strange how Disney thought that Pocahontas was going to be their big hitter. Yeah, I don't know how many people know this, but Lion King and Pocahontas were made simultaneously. Pocahontas was meant to be this big thing, going deep into social commentary and themes of the time. And of our time too, I guess. Lion King was something that they were working on on the side, but oh boy, how they were surprised. Also a fun fact, The Lion King managed to have a sequel that doesn't suck. Much. Anyway, I think I'm gonna watch this movie. After all, I need to do something to celebrate my birthday. I just need to get the rest of this wrapping paper off. What the fuck is this? The Lion- the- the- the 2019 remake. Is this someone's idea of a joke? Oh goody, Jean Oliver stars in it as Zazu. Fuck him and fuck this movie. Why don't you just have James Portnow write the damn thing if you're trying to take blows to my past? And let's just have J.K. Rowling write the script. Why not? From an old friend, my ass. Probably from my goddamn elementary school bully. I wouldn't be surprised. I suppose that someone out there wants me to review this. Here's a review. The Lion King 2019 sucks. I'm getting rid of this. Hey. Mister, you dropped this. Go ahead and keep it. I don't want it. Really? I don't think I need it. My family already has a copy of The Lion King. It's my favorite. Yeah, mine too. Really? What's your favorite character? Mine's Simba. Hey kid, haven't your parents ever told you not to talk to strangers? Not really, but you seem nice. What's your name anyway? I used to get that a lot. Oh, my name's John. Really? My name's Jonathan. But, but you spell it with an H before the N, as in J-O-H-N. Yeah, how do you know? Because that's how Jonathan should be spelled. John is spelled J-O-H-N, so Jonathan should be spelled similarly. Exactly! I don't know how, but you seem to know how I think. Yeah, I don't know either, kid. Hey, do you want to watch this movie? I haven't watched it all week. Not really, no. Well... We can watch Aladdin instead. On a second thought, Lion King it is. This isn't the Lion King. This looks like one of those nature things my mom watches. That's because this is the Lion King remake. It came out last year, as of the recording of this video, barring any time paradoxes. 
And coincidentally, it was actually the last film that I saw in theaters. And coincidentally, it might be the last film that I ever see in theaters. Thanks for that, COVID. What is that? Uh, you'll find out someday, I'm sure. Anyway, in the 2010s, Disney realized a couple of things. They realized that they like money, and they also realized that they don't like doing any work. And they definitely don't like coming up with new ideas. So they had this genius idea. Considering that many of their films were remakes of classic fairy tales, or other stories like Shakespeare, as this one is, they decided, why not just do that all over again? And so they did. It started in 2010 with Alice in Wonderland, which I will give a bit of a pass to. Alice in Wonderland is a book that has a ton of different possible interpretations. You could go quite loyal like the original film, or you can go in a completely different direction. I've heard the book thematically is about growing up into an adult world where the rules are all strange and don't quite make sense. Which, as we all know, is not applicable to reality in any way whatsoever. Although you can go in any tonal direction that you'd really like. American McGee went all in for the horror aspect in the PC Alice game. Wow, I love that game. I just started playing it the other day. Uh, how old are you, kid? Eight. Why? Uh, just asking. After Alice, though, Disney's remake fever really took off. Next, it was Maleficent, a role swap Sleeping Beauty where the bad guys were really the good guys. I would be similarly forgiving of this if it didn't come out of Disney's Wicked Envy, a movie that they desperately seem to want to remake because they keep trying again and again. And after that, they just gave up all pretense of creativity. Cinderella was absolutely pointless. The Jungle Book confused creativity with just doing random nonsense, like casting Christopher Walken, because this movie about monkeys was made by monkeys. Then there was Beauty and the Beast, a movie that felt like a desperate attempt to keep a career going by starring someone who feels like they're desperately trying to keep a career going. And then last year, we actually had four of these things. Oh, come on. They can't all be that bad. Disney remade 101 Dalmatians, and I thought that was pretty good. You ever watch The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Yeah, it's a pretty good show. Imagine, if you will, The Fresh Prince as the genie. What? But why, though? Because the future hates you. But I mean, they got the Mufasa guy to do Mufasa again, right? Why couldn't they do... Moving on! Moving on! But as an aside, it was quite the tacky move to remake Aladdin when they did. Robin Williams was indisposed for only five years before the movie was made. And keep in mind, they announced this movie even closer to that date. Quite honestly, it was almost disgusting as what Nickelodeon did after Steven... Moving on! Their next big production was The Lion King, which they insisted time and time again that it was a live-action film. Well, it looks like a live-action movie. You think they could have gotten all those animals to actually do this kind of stuff? Please, this review is more live-action than the movie. They did it in Babe. And in Charlotte's Web. It's actually far more like Dinosaur. Ooh, me and my family saw that movie earlier this year. Uh, was it good? I don't remember anything about it. I have a feeling that that's going to be foreshadowing. The point is that Disney basically did exactly that. They used CGI animals on a live-action background. However, while they considered Dinosaur a part of their animated canon, at least in the United States, they considered Lion King 2019 a completely different live-action film. You know, until it became the highest-grossing animated film of all time, and was showcased for animation awards. You obviously know, considering the title of this video, that I consider this one animated. The only difference is that in the start of the movie, there is legitimately one completely live-action shot at the beginning of the film because the director was a pretentious sod, and he wanted to see if anyone could tell the difference. So beyond the change in animation style, it is more or less a shot-for-shot -shot remake. So it's exactly the same movie? No, don't be stupid. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, let's take a look. Let's start with the most defining aspect of this movie, the animation. Are you sure that this is animated? All those animals look real. They look just like they would at the zoo. Yeah, and believe it or not, that's actually the biggest problem with this movie. Better animation makes the movie worse? It's higher quality. It doesn't mean that it's better. Realization versus stylization. Tell me, John, which of these video games looks better? Tomb Raider 2 or Spyro 2? I guess Tomb Raider 2 looks closer to reality. Yeah, back in the year 2000 at least. While Spyro 2 has kept its own cartoonish style that hasn't aged that badly. Tomb Raider 2, while it doesn't look horrible in this day and age, it's clearly just blocks and polygons now. Yeah, I guess you're right. I can't imagine what Tomb Raider's gonna look like in 20 years. Yeah... Realism hinders this movie a lot, actually. Let's take it back to the original for a minute, because this is mostly seen with Pumbaa, actually. Ooh, I love Pumbaa! Hakuna Matata! No, no, no! 
This is not a musical review. You cannot sing and you've never learned how. <sighs> Fine. There is one thing about Pumbaa in the original. I can only guess the kind of guy that this kid is gonna grow up to be. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a little known fact about Pumbaa from the original movie. And this might be hard to realize if you're not paying particular attention to the movie. Pumbaa is red. How long did it take you to notice that? I swear, this is why kids should be in charge. Hey, don't take that tone with me. I figured it out a lot quicker than the director of the Lion King remake. Pumbaa is just this awful shade of grayish brown in this film. But. Yeah, real warthogs aren't red like Pumbaa. Bingo, you figured out the problem with this whole movie concept. There's a reason that Pumbaa is red in the original. Notice how in the segments that he's on screen, most of the backgrounds are jungles. They're greens, bright, vibrant greens. Red contrasts with green and stands out. Now taking it back to reality, Pumbaa and all of the other animals for that matter are their natural real world colors. And there's a reason why they are those colors in reality. Warthogs are the color that they are to hide from predators in the jungles and in mud. Warthogs are this grayish brown to blend in. Are you starting to see the problem here? Not only that, but pigs and warthogs are pretty infamous for being, well, ugly animals. Warthogs especially. So that completely shoots the animation principle of appeal right in the face. I mean, you could absolutely make a warthog appealing in animation, you know, if you wanted to fantasize it and make it more of a cartoon like the original did. Getting back to the basic point though, arctic animals like polar bears are white because they live in the snow and they can use it to hide from predators or to capture prey. Jungle animals tend to be either brown or green to hide from predators or capture prey. So let's talk film for a second. It's generally considered a bad thing when actors cannot stand out or blend into the scenery. And yet, that's the premise for this fucking movie. <gasps> you said a bad word. And I'm sure I'm going to say a lot more of them before the end of this. I can't imagine saying those kinds of words. You know what else helps the actors emote? Let me guess. Emotions? You know what, you're a bright kid. I can only imagine how life could have turned out. One of the most powerful tools in an actor's toolbox is their physical and facial emotions. You could tell a whole lot just from how an actor looks on screen. The original movie really understood that. You can see the shock and awe from when Mufasa fell into the stampede. Spoilers, dude. Well, let me keep spoiling it for you. A real lion can't emote like a human can. So when the camera pulls back, Simba just kinda stares. When Mufasa dies, you can see every single emotion that Simba goes through in the animated film. The live action one has Simba more or less go through the motions. It's almost impossible to relate to many of these characters because of this. In the animated version, as Simba is getting a lecture from Zazu, you can see him being annoyed, being visibly disgusted by the prospect of marrying Nala to a smug smile as he threatens to fire Zazu. Right there in the span of a minute is more emotion than Simba has in the entire 2019 version. That can't be right. Remember, babe, the animals in that one had plenty of readable emotions, and they were actual real animals. Well, that's the issue. Babe was trying to make real animals fantastical. The Lion King was trying to make fantastical animals real. CGI animals, or their effects, can actually do this. The problem is that whoever, the director I guess, wanted the animals as close to reality as possible, which they succeeded. They succeeded so well that Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia movie, which came out in 2005, is more expressive and an interesting character and a better effect because of it than any of the lions in this movie. Come on, it can't be all that bad. Just wait until you get a hold of Scar. I don't see him. No, you do see him, he's that one right there. How is that Scar? He doesn't even look like he has one. Because Scar from the original movie was a cartoonish character of what a lion actually is. I mean, does it really make sense if he's related to Mufasa to look so different? Actual lions, evil or not, do not have those evil green and yellow eyes. But he doesn't stand out at all. I keep forgetting who is who when more than one lion is on the screen. Yeah, a lot of animals don't have that much variance. Like, humans and dogs are the only major exception. And that last one is because humans mess with dogs' genetics and breeding for- Do I want to know about that? No, not really. You, you don't want to know that. Let's move on to the fact that reality is ugly as hell. Come on, real life has a lot of pretty things. Yeah, but most of this remake takes place in the savanna and in the desert, with brief interludes into the jungle. It's just filled with yellows and browns. The original movie was able to use color extremely effectively. Down to the opening shots, the animated sunrise 
looks better because it's able to use exaggerated hues of orange. Think of it this way, there are plenty of bugs in this movie. In real life, you can't exactly make bugs look appealing, with certain obvious exceptions. But the animated movie was able to make them more vibrant colors, which toned down the gross out of characters actually eating bugs. The remake doesn't do that, so you see characters eat actual real life bugs. And then of course you have the Uncanny Valley to worry about. You mean where Mufasa got killed? No, the Uncanny Valley is a concept that means the more realistic something looks, the more easy you notice the issues and the flaws that it has when it inevitably doesn't look normal. While they don't go deep into the expressions with the animation, they do attempt to try and use cartoonish body language, and sometimes the characters talk in relative slang. Simona is especially guilty for this. It is the most awkward part of the movie, seeing real animals look like they were pulled straight out of a cartoon. Isn't that the whole movie, though? Yep, that's the entire movie. Well, I mean, looks aren't everything, right? Even though I think Tomb Raider 2 looks better, I still have more fun with Spyro. In fact, I can't wait for Spyro 4! I, uh, I think that you can. Come on, don't you think you're being too negative? Alright, let's try this. Tell me one of your favorite parts from the movie. I like the songs a lot. Oh yeah, the songs. The songs are the best part. Now that's being unfair. Circle of Life sounds a bit different, but it still sounds really good. It makes you excited to watch the movie, even though it is just watching regular animals. I don't agree. The singer sounds a lot more tired than she did in the original. Not to mention the words were much clearer in the original film. It's the of life, and it moves us I sometimes have a hard time figuring out what the new singer is actually singing. Not to mention that the song isn't well synced with the actual animation. You know this lyric? We step blinking into the sun. The original has a baby giraffe step blinking into the sun in that lyric. And blinking, step into the sun. The remake just follows a baby giraffe. It doesn't have as much of a punch. And blinking, step into the sun. Granted, it's better than Prince Ali thinking that a peacock was an exotic type mammal. When it comes to exotic type mammals, everybody help me out. And to be honest, it is still better than a lot of the other songs. Well, how do you ruin Can't Wait to Be King? Oh, that is extremely simple. You walk up to this guy here and think that he, in any stretch of the imagination, can sing. Or act. John Oliver is a quote-unquote comedian, and a horrendous one, who has shown no indication that he can possibly act as anything other than a doofus. I get that he's popular, but why would you tap this guy for a movie? I mean, he does kinda look like Zazu already. Too bad the character in the movie doesn't. How do you make it so Zazu is only blue like half of the time? Zazu being a vibrant shade of blue was the most defining thing about his design. But even ignoring that, you probably couldn't make his performance worse if you actually had John Oliver sing The Morning Report. Morning Zazu, you have The Morning Report. Yes sire! <clears throat> Uh, ten flamingos are taking a stand, uh, two giraffe were caught necking, the buzz from the beach. Uh, what does necking mean? It means the person who wrote this film was a complete and utter dumbass! A necking joke in a kid's film. The original film stopped itself before making a fart joke. And I got down on it! Every time that I... Pumper, not in front of the kids. Oh, sorry. But no, the live action one is the more grown up version of the film. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell when you didn't spend half your runtime making Donald Trump jokes, even if it had nothing to do with your overall news segment. Who's Donald- Never ask me that. Never ask me that again. So here's how John Oliver sings, or more accurately, tries to, or even more accurately, desperately hopes to. Well, I've never seen a king of beasts with quite so little hair. This child is getting wildly out of wing. Zazu's rendition of A Lovely Bunch of Coconuts from the original was better than anything John Oliver can sing. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts, dee 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 dee, there they are, standing in a row. Bing, 
For half of the song, John Oliver sounds like he's just sing talking. When he actually is trying to sing, he sounds continually like he's out of breath. It continually breaks the meter and it's distracting throughout the entire song. So let's talk about the actual purpose of the song in the story. In the movie, both of them, the song is there to help Nala and Simba escape from Zazu so they can find the elephant graveyard, or what they think is an elephant graveyard. And in the remake, Zazu is actually able to keep up with them quite well, continually catching on to them. There are a bunch of animals here, but it's oddly enough the one time in the movie where the lions don't blend in with their background. Take it back to the original. Because animation can be exaggerated, there are explosions of color. There is continual chaos. The cubs don't just run under elephants, they ride on ostriches, escape through a parade of zebras, get animals to turn back and forth, they can climb up on the necks of giraffes, and they're able to escape when the animals create a tower that collapses. This is where realism starts biting the remake in the ass. I thought Zazu was doing that. A lot of things are, to be completely honest with you. If you want realism, just read the original Shakespeare play. Can You Feel the Love Tonight also has its own problems. Can you feel the love tonight? They do know that it's daytime, right? Sweet caress of twilight. Yeah. I don't think they do. Could you imagine being the cameraman on this production? Just point a camera at the goddamn jungle for two hours. And you still manage to mess it up by shooting a song called Can You Feel the Love Tonight during broad fucking daylight. Seriously. You're able to CGI Noah's entire arc, but you can't add a nighttime filter over a song called Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Can you feel the love tonight? The peace the evening brings. You know there are children present, right? I'm not the one who decided to put in a necking joke in The Lion King. I still don't know what that means. This was always my least favorite song anyway, but this one sounds worse. Even ignoring the day-night cycle, I can barely hear Simba in this one. That's because Beyonce overpowers him completely. Because that's who Beyonce is. Seriously, whose idea was it to get a woman who made a career off of singles about how independent she is and how she don't need no man but herself to sing a soft love ballad. The same people who thought a squawking parrot could sing? It's not that Donald Glover is a bad singer by any stretch of the imagination, but deep, passionate vocals about his feelings is not his area of expertise. I mean, his most famous song, This Is America, wasn't exactly elevated by how strong of a singer he was. His strengths as a singer tend to be lyrical material. And, uh, speaking of lyrics, this is true with both versions, but this is one of Elton John's worst songs. The Not Lion King version is a bit better, but it's just mopey dopey and it doesn't really carry the actual emotions of something like Rocket Man. There is a calm surrender to the rush of day, when the heat of a rolling wave can be turned away. What, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything! I'm sure they make up for it with Be Prepared. It's the best song in the movie, right? I mean, how does someone mess that up? Oh, that's an easy one. They messed it up by not singing the song at all. Wait, they took it out of the movie? Oh no, it's still in the movie. It's just not a song. It's spoken word. So prepare for the coup of the century. Prepare for the murkiest scam. The cage of denial is simply why I'll be king. Well, spoken is a misnomer. Scar whispers some of the song, like, be prepared. Other times, he's shouting at the top of his goddamn lungs. And that actually brings me to another problem with this movie, a pretty major one. The audio mix is very bad. Surprisingly bad for a Disney production. It was clearly made for a theater audience, but I actually kinda remember this also being a problem in the theater. Watching the thing on a home screen, I had to keep fighting with my volume. Sometimes the characters would be shouting everything, trying to show the grandness of everything. Sometimes they'd whisper things cold and calculating that I couldn't fucking hear! But why though? Why would anyone do this? Half the lyrics are missing! My best guess is that they changed up Scar's personality, quite drastically, in this movie. It's actually probably the biggest change in the entire movie. Huh? Why would they do that? Scar was an awesome villain! Not to mention, Be Prepared was a pretty big reason why. Well, it's a criticism that's risen up towards the original movie. After Mufasa's death, Scar more or less changes personality. 
In the original film, he goes from turning hyenas into his own personal army, but after he conquers the Pride Lands, he becomes a prima donna. He doesn't really do anything in the second half of the movie. But the second half of the movie isn't about Scar. It's about Simba and him learning to deal with his past. It doesn't really matter what Scar is like after that, and it's not like his character changes that much. A lot of people want to be king or whatever because they think it's easy. I could totally buy Scar wanting to be king so he can act like he does in the second half of the original movie. Well, tell that to the critics, I guess. I hate critics. Did they hate his voice actor too? No, from what I remember, people loved Jeremy Irons. Then why did they get rid of him? They got Mufasa's actor back. I think. Yeah, that is definitely James Earl Jones redoing his voice from the original. From what I can tell though, he is the only returning actor, which is not only really distracting, but it's a bad idea. James Earl Jones is long past his prime in this movie. He sounds very winded throughout most of the movie. And Mufasa is someone who is supposed to sound all powerful and in the prime of his life. That's what makes his death so tragic. From what I heard though, they didn't even ask Jeremy Irons if he wanted to reprise his role. But he would have done it. Which reminds me way too much of that Powerpuff Girls reboot. Wait, they made a remake of the Powerpuff Girls? That's awesome! Yeah, it's... it's really awesome, kid. I don't get it. If both the movies are animated, why didn't they just use the recordings from the original? Oh, some of Mufasa's lines were so unusable that they actually did. But they couldn't do it one for one all the way through because, despite trying to be a shot for shot remake, it's half an hour longer. Because this movie is a glorified tech demo, what they'll do all too often is pause the story to just stare at animals, or whatever they can do with CGI. I mean, they could have filled that time with Simba actually having some time growing up instead of having him walk across the log. Seriously, in the original, the three characters bob their head and dance the music. In this one, they just walk across the log and poof, Simba's an adult now. Yeah, you've grown 400 pounds since we started. Meanwhile, I look exactly the same. Means no. Pointing out your problems does not make them go away. Do you have to be so loud? Well, it's kind of a catchphrase. It's annoying is what it is. Seriously, if this movie is half an hour longer, what did they fill it with? Oh, uh, remember when the fur flew on the wind and made it to Rafiki to tell him that Simba was still alive? Yeah? Because that's too mystical and mysterious, they decided to show the entire journey of that piece of fur. Simba shakes it off his head, we follow its long journey towards Rafiki. Down a river, carried by a bird, eaten by a giraffe, and then shit out and rolled by a dung beetle. Excuse me, what? Oh, because the hair start flowing on the winter Rafiki is too fantastical for adults, we need to see the whole journey. Yes, I got that part, but what about the... Oh, the giraffe eating it, shitting out, and the dung beetle rolling it towards Rafiki? Yes, that. Because this is the adult and grown-up version of the movie for more mature audiences. Sounds like being a grown-up sucks. Trust me, kid, you don't know the half of it. Everything sucks when you grow up. I'm just gonna get rid of this thing real quick. Wait, maybe it gets better. It doesn't. Trust me. And this time, don't come back. Ouch. Who threw this at me? Uh... I, I did. Sorry about that. Well, take it back. We've got too much to worry about to watch a stupid movie. What What the hell is this thing? A TARDIS? No, it's the Lion King. May I ask who you are? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Well, you look like the guy on the neighborhood watch sign. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I've heard worse. Anyway, I gotta go. I need to destroy this thing before it causes me any other trouble. The Lion King? Isn't that a good movie, though? I mean, it's no hunchback, but... No, it's actually a spooky version of the movie from a dystopian future where everything's gone wrong. Right. Like, I'm gonna believe that. But how do you explain the cover? It's probably like those adultified versions of Harry Potter books with more serious fantasy imagery to get insecure people to buy them. Come on, watch it with me and I'll prove to you how terrible it is. Fine. It's not like my time is limited or anything. How busy could you possibly- I just turned 18. That should say a little bit of it. So, uh... Movie time? Is that Simba's fur in a pile of giraffe dung being pushed by a beetle? Hey, I warned you. Yes, but why? Why did anyone think this was a good idea? Because it's more realistic than Simba lying down on the ground and creating the word sex in the sky, alerting Rafiki to him being alive. You know it spells out SFX in the original? Right, and John Oliver had no idea what he's talking about when he made a joke about giraffes necking in a movie rated PG. Look. Are we done yet? I've got a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it. Whatever happens to Hakuna Matata? I'm a senior with absolutely no clue what I want to do with the rest of my life. I can't stay interested in anything to save my life. And I've desperately got to write a book or make a video game or do something. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to watch this new extra credits video. And these guys help you out? It's more than that. They inspire me. They care about this stuff in ways that no one else I know really does. And let me guess, you're gonna hit it up with some nostalgia critic later tonight. Yeah, how'd you know? Because I remember how I used to feel. What I used to do when I was your age. I don't think the Nostalgia Critic was making stuff ten years ago. And Extra Credits just really started their show a few months ago. If I were you, though, I'd just turn this off right now. Trust me, it's not going to end well. Are you kidding? They're some of the only things that give me solace in the present. Well, let me tell you, in the future, it's not going to be so pleasant. And how do you know that? Because I'm the ghost of Christmas future, okay? But it's... Not Christmas. Hey, where'd you go? I want to finish the movie. Who's, Who's that? that? My name's Jonathan. Who are you? Uh, some call me Johnny? He's your future self, and I'm out of here. Future self? Uh... Oh my gosh, that's the password. You are my future self. No, the password was Subaru Arcade Tokens. Gotcha. So you're my future self? Yeah, from ten years, it seems. Wow, you're what I look like as an adult? I don't know about that. I definitely don't feel like an adult. I don't feel like I'll ever really be one. What's the matter? Haven't you published a book or made a video game or something like that? No, I haven't done anything like that. But you're gonna, right? I would if I could. Look, I've gotta go. Why does everyone keep doing that? I don't need to use any kind of password, do I? Not unless you don't think that I'm your future self, I guess. Interesting to know that at least I'm still alive. Feels like just barely sometimes. Maybe Patrick can... Patrick's been gone for a while now. Let's just say it caught me at a bad time. Then maybe we should wait for 38-year-old us. Y you might be waiting for a while on that one. Come on, the future can't really be all that bad, can it? I told you. I come from a dystopian future where everything's gone wrong. Yeah, so do I. I have no prospects in life. I could go to college and then get thousands of dollars in debt for something that I don't even know if I'm gonna like, or I could just wing it and crash and burn because I can't learn to code. I've got no chance of actually publishing something, and my stepdad is constantly on my case. And you're coming to me about some kind of bad movie? It's not just the movie. It's not any remake, really. Current events are fucking crazy right now, and I think that I'm going crazy myself because of them. Well, you are talking to yourself. All this has done is remind me that it's ten years later, and I just feel as lost and confused as I did when I first became an adult. I take it we never made that game or published that book. No, we did that, but both of them were shit. I can't believe that I'm gonna grow up to be you. Yeah, I know. It's a life of just one failure after another. No, that you managed to write a book and make a game, but don't appreciate that. Do you know how much I've been tearing my hair out in desperation to do stuff like that? Just wait till Minecraft comes out. That'll shut you up for a while, making you waste more time. What, have I done nothing for ten years? No, you do plenty. You lose friends, best friends, make a fool out of yourself repeatedly, become so jaded that you become afraid to speak your mind. Yeah, I've lost best friends too, remember? Become afraid? That implies I was ever able to overcome this in the first place. Do you think that I'd be able to tell off anyone who isn't myself? Not yet. What else haven't you told me you've done in ten years' time? Or do you think it's a mistake that even I'm standing here today? Or did I make the wrong decision on that one? No, it wasn't a mistake. You made the right choice. And from where I'm standing, it's not a mistake that you're standing here either. Look, there's plenty about me that you don't know yet. And the more I learn, the more okay I am with how things turn out. Maybe it is like that movie. We end up idealizing the past, forgetting how flawed that it really was. Lion King wasn't perfect. The past isn't perfect either. And we can forget how bad it was, and apparently how far we've come. You want to know how Extra Credits turns out? I went ranting on it for about an hour. Quite frankly, no I don't. Things are fine now, and they give me inspiration now. If things do go bad or whatever, I'll always have these moments that lead up to the person that I become. I feel like... I've been dealt a lot of shit lately. Yes, we have. But you know what I say to that? Ow! My childhood hit me with a stick! It doesn't matter. It's in the past. Yeah, it, it still hurt, though. It doesn't matter. It's in the past. And everything I'm going through right now, you've survived. And everything you're going through right now, you're going to survive, too. You gotta make your past proud. I... I'm sorry, I don't know if I can do that anymore. Do you have to be so negative all the time? 
Try and look on the bright side of things. The place you're in now isn't going to be the place you're in forever. Yeah, so what are you gonna do? Alright, I'm, I'm gonna think about this for a bit. Then I'm probably going to make another review. Wait, review? You mean like the Nostalgia Critic? Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my job. Can you do me a favor? What? Start appreciating where you are in life. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I could be on the other side of that screen. So what are you going to be reviewing next? I think I'm going to take a crack at Quest for Camelot. Oh, that's my second favorite Disney movie. Garrett is just the best. You know, that's not a... Like I said, appreciate how far we've come. Right. I guess I got a lot of thinking to do. See ya. Make me an author someday. And make me a good one. Something like J.K. Rowling. Uh, you got a lot to learn as well. I'm sure... I'll find out when the time comes. I suppose this is the part where I meet future me. You might be waiting on that one for a while. I don't understand. Yeah, there seems to be a great deal that you don't. Yeah, as I've been learning. Let me spell it out for you then. You are the future John you're talking about. And whatever comes further is exactly whatever you make of it. I feel like I've got a long road going forward. It's gonna be a while to fix things up. Moving on from these old issues. Building burned bridges. Trust me on this one. The long road is much better than the short one. I think it's about time I stopped hiding. And maybe start getting out of the shadows. It's a place to start. Before you go, I have a birthday present for you. From an old friend, huh? Oh, let's see what it is. Spyro reignited on the Switch. Just a small token to show you that maybe the future isn't always that bad. That good things do come along if you open your mind and your eyes to them. Thank you for this. I've got to go. I've got a long journey ahead of me. Sorry I missed your 18th. Here's a present from an old friend. A present, huh? A movie. Meet the Robinsons. Just kidding.